Jay. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Janmad Yasya Yato Divayat Itaratas Chate Suavigya Swarat. Tene Brahma Hidaya Adikavaye Muyanti at Surayaha. Tejo Vari Madam Yatabini Mayo Yatrat Chisago Misha. Ram Naswena Sadani Rasta Kuhakam Satyam Param Di Mahi. O my Lord, Sri Krishna, son of Vasudeva, a well-pervading personality of Godhead, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth and the primal cause of all causes of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of manifested universes. <clears throat> he is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he's independent because there's no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji, the original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen on fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes, temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature, appear factual although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna, who is, who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma projita kaitravotra paramo nirmatsara namasatam vedyam vastavam atravastu shivadam tapa trayon mulanam Shri Mad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite Kimba Purir Ishwaraha Sadyo Hridi Avarudyate Tra Krite Bihi Susu Subhistakshana Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truths which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from the illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpaturur galitam phalam sukamukad amrita drabya samyutam pibata bhagavatam rasam alayam Mohor aho raska bhuvibhavakaha. O expert and thoughtful men, relish Srimad Bhagavatam. The mature fruit of the desire to Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadev Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Although its nectarine juice was already relishable for all. including liberated souls. Shinvatam Svakata Krishna Punya 
Shravana Kirtana Hiryantakshto Hibhadrani Vidunati Shrihitsatam To hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita is, it, is itself righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna Lord Krishna is dwelling in everyone's heart. Acts as a best wishing friend and purifies a devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nasta presu bhadresu nityam bhagavata sevaya bhagavati uttama sloke bhaktir bhavati naistiki in this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge as he hears more about the Bhagavatam from the devotees. Uh, I'm sorry, as he hears more about Krishna from the devotees and from, I'm sorry, as he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajas tumo bhava Kamalo badayasche Cheta itarina vidam Stitham satve prasiddhati In this way, devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. I'm sorry. By development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus, material lust and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso Bhagavad bhakti yogataha Bhagavad tattva vijnanam mukta sangasya jayate When these impurities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness becomes enlivened by devotional service and understands the science of God perfectly. Vidyate hridaya grantis chidyante sarvasamsaya siyante chasyakarmani drista evat manishwari Thus Bhakti Yoga severs the hard knot of material affection and enables one to come at once to the stage of a samsayam samagram. Understanding of the Supreme Absolute Truth Personality of Godhead. Therefore, only by hearing from Krishna or from his devotee in Krishna consciousness, one can understand the science of Krishna. Shimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 17, Verse Number 35. Sutta Uvacha Parikshitaivam Adista Sakale Jatave Patu. Tam uda udyata san ahedam danda panim ivodyatam. Translation by Srila Prabhupada. Sri Sutta Goswami said, The personality Kali, thus being ordered by Maharaj Parikshit, began to tremble in fear, seeing the king before him like Yamaraj, ready to kill him. Kali spoke to the king as follows, purported by his divine grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. The king was ready to kill the personality of Kali at once, as soon as he disobeyed his order. Otherwise, the king had no objection to allowing him to prolong his life. 
The personality of Kali also, after attempting to get rid of the punishment in various ways, decided that he must surrender unto him. Thus he began to tremble in fear of his life. The king, or the executive head, must be so strong as to stand before the personality of Kali like the personality of death, the Yamaraj. The king's order must be obeyed, otherwise the culprit's life is at risk. That is the way to rule the personalities of Kali, who create disturbance in the normal life of the state citizens. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Now we know why there's so much confusion and, and strife in society, because we don't have leaders who are ready to act decisively. And this is the, the point. Maharaj Pariksit was ready to kill Kali. No questions asked. And Kali real when once realized that, it tried to squirm out of such a position, but the but Maharaj Pariksit wouldn't give him any leeway, would not give him any space to squirm out of the res the responsibility for having tortured Bhumi Devi and especially Dharma. So that's what a real leader is. They subdue the enemies of the state severely. But yet, they're strong as a thunderbolt and soft as a feather. If, they, if they, uh, the miscreants surrender and uh, remain humble, then they can be forgiven but not uh, allowed in any way to associate with the normal society. Why? Because when a person is dedicated to doing evil and think it's fun or th right or whatever, they have uh, almost an incurable disease. Almost. Everybody has a chance to totally surrender to the Lord. And, and, but however, people who have tasted the so-called pleasure of domination, causing suffering to others, feeling elated by such power, and deriving some kind of uh, warped uh, pleasure in, in inflicting pain and uh, suffering to others, uh, that is a very serious disease. And Oftentimes, it's almost impossible for people, almost impossible for people to uh, come back to a normal state. Therefore, such people should be killed or they should be banned from society. So, we see the king's order must be obeyed. Otherwise, the culprit's life is in risk. That is the way to rule the personalities of Kali who create disturbance in the normal life of state citizens. Now, in the time of Maharaj Prikshit, there was only one personality of Kali. And Prabhupada says, but today there's thousands of them, millions of them. Right? And they're creating havoc everywhere. So we must be ready to um, subdue them. Now, as I've said before, devotees are killers. But in Kali Yuga, they kill by convincing people to give up sense gratification. In other words, they kill the desire in people to engage in sense gratification, to, be, to dominate, to exploit, to torture, to uh, inflict pain, etc. Now, that's not an easy job uh, because uh, the force you're using is a spiritual force to convince them that they're doing something wrong and that they can actually be happy, they can actually be a controller, not of others, but they can control themselves and, and thus become peaceful and happy in, in life. So it requires quite a, a lot of uh, 
spiritual strength or shakti to be able to do that. But if we follow the regulative principles, if we chant regularly our rounds, if we uh, respect Mahaprasadam, if we go on Sankirtan and preach and chant and dance, then gradually you develop the strength and the determination and the knowledge that's given to you by Krishna through revelation to be able to convince others. <coughs> so this is also explained in the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam uh, in depth by Srila Prabhupada. He says in the first canto, second chapter, verse 6, Vadanti tat tatva vidas tatvam yajganamaya advayam brahmeti paramatmeti bhagavan iti sabyate. So he says that the absolute truth is both subject and object. This is a very significant statement. It's a philosophical statement. He is both the subject and the object. So if you have a, a sentence where it says, Jani missed his friends and thus felt very lonely. Okay, in that sentence, Jani is the subject and the object are his friends, you see. So Prabhupada says the absolute truth is both the subject and the object. So that's a very profound statement. Krishna, you can say it in a different way. You can say Krishna is everything because everything is made of Krishna's energies. So he's both the subject and the object. What do people learn in the schools today. They learn that the material world has nothing to do. Uh, it, it stands by itself and there's no spiritual world. So they want to make matter the subject and the object. Therefore, there are Mayavadi atheists. The real duality is Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead everything emanates from him and everything that emanates is simultaneously one and different from him. Therefore, Krishna is everything, but everything is not Krishna. Everything is made of Krishna's energies, both externally and internally. Like, for example, uh, Krishna pervades Every atom, he's present in every atom of the universe. He's also present in the heart of every living entity. He's also the support of everything, spiritual and material, through the Brahma Jyoti, which, permeate, which, which uh, permeates everything. Uh, just like the air permeates everything, but the Brahma Jyoti permeates all the expans expansive energies of Krishna. So in two ways, the Lord is present everywhere, through Paramatma and through the Brahma Jyoti. And therefore, he's conscious of everything. No living entity can claim to be conscious of everything. We can claim to be conscious of our body, but not of everything. So therefore, Krishna is the absolute truth. He is the subject and the object. And there's no qualitative difference. Now, this is amazing. That means that if you become Krishna conscious, you'll be able to see Krishna everywhere and in everything. That's the vision of a devotee. That's what we're trying to teach here, how to see Krishna in everything. That doesn't mean everything is Krishna. It does mean, however, that Krishna is everything because it's all made from his energies. If, if everything is Krishna, then you could bring the dog into the temple, put him on the altar, and start doing arti to the dog. Uh, but that's, that would be a major mistake. And that's the mistake that uh, my body atheists make. Okay, so then, uh, therefore, this Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan are qualitatively one and the same. Well, yeah, because it's all Krishna coming from Krishna or it is Krishna. So the same substance is realized as impersonal Brahman, 
by the students of the Upanishads as localized Paramatma, by the Hiranyagarbhas or the yogis, and as Bhagavan by the devotees. So Bhagavan or the Personality of Godhead, Krishna, uh, may be compared, uh, I'm sorry, uh, so Krishna is the last word in uh, the, the search of the truth. Okay, so uh, this, uh, therefore he is oh, at the same time Bhagavan, Paramatma, and Brahman. Okay, so uh, it's, this can be compared to the sun. The sun, the sun globe, and the sun's effulgence. They're all one, but they can be perceived separately. So this simultaneous oneness and difference is present everywhere in the universe. We just gave an example of one thing, the sun, which is in the material universe, which is considered to be made of matter. But yet, it also manifests this simultaneous oneness and difference. And one perceives the sun through different angles of vision. So some people just talk about the sun rays, and other, some people talk about the sun globe, and some people may talk about Vivaswan, the sun god. And some people may talk about Krishna, the origin of the Brahma Jyoti, which is reflected in the material world uh, from the sun. So the energy that the sun is, is, is expanding is coming from the Brahma Jyoti. So ultimately, Krishna is at the source of everything. So besides all that, Krishna is Abhigya Swarat. So, so in the second line of the... Uh, First mantra, Ishapanishad, I mean of Srimad uh, Bhagavatam, Janmarasya Yata Nivya Taratas Chartisra Vigya Swarat. Avigya Swarat. So that means that he is all, has all knowledge and he is completely independent. No one else can equal him. And even the demigods cannot equal him in this respect. So he's self sufficient and he's cognizant and is free from the illusion of relativity. So Prabhupada explains, in the relative world, the knower is different from the known. But in the absolute truth, the knower and the known are one and the same thing. That's why it says that Krishna is both the subject and the object. So we are living in this relative world, and there's a difference between our soul and our body. There's a difference between, and, and because of that, we see relativity everywhere. And even a scientist, like a scientist like uh, Einstein, he, he formulated, uh, not, he's not the only one, people did it before him, but he formulated the uh, principle of relativity in the universe. One thing is relative to another, in other, in other words, one thing depends on something else, which depends on something else, and then you have an infinite regress there because they, ex they refuse to accept that there's anything absolute. So did Einstein also. He refused to accept that there was anything absolute. That mindset is actually an illusion. Why? Because there is an absolute truth. It's Krishna. He is the supreme absolute truth. So there's a difference between the concept of God and the concept of the supreme absolute truth. Uh, there are many gods. Brahma can be considered a god. Shiva can be considered a god. Indra can be considered a god. Chandra can be say There are many gods. Krishna, of course, is the supreme god. But there's only one supreme absolute truth. Shiva is not the supreme absolute truth. Brahma is not the supreme absolute truth. But Krishna is, because everything is emanating from him. Therefore, he is both the subject and the object, and there's no illusion of relativity in Krishna. So now we're talking very philosophically and scientifically to know Krishna. <clears throat> 
So Prabhupada says, but in the absolute truth, the knower and the known are one and the same thing. In the relative world, the knower is the living spirit or the supreme energy, whereas the known is the inert matter or inferior energy. Therefore, there is a duality of inferior and superior energy, whereas in the absolute realm, the knower and the known are the same superior energy. So Krishna doesn't see a difference between the para prakriti and apara prakriti. These are both his energies, right? But we may see a difference between the two because we are overwhelmed by relativity. Uh, one thing depending on another thing, depending on another thing, and having an infinite in regress that it's infinitely one thing depends on another thing, and there's no absolute thing. But, it's, but Krishna is the absolute supreme personality. He's the absolute supreme truth. So therefore, as we say in colloquial English, the buck stops with Krishna. This will be rejected by every atheist. They will not accept this because that means that if there is a supreme God like Krishna who is the source of everything, they have to surrender. See? So they'll do everything to refuse to accept such a concept. And they insist that everything is relative. As soon as you say everything is relative, you're in an illusory space. And you never can have any definite fixed ab supreme absolute truth when everything is relative. So there are three kinds of energy the supreme uh, of the supreme energetic. There's the internal energy, the marginal energy, and the external energy. <clears throat> so there, there's no difference between the energy and the energetic. In other words, there's no difference between Krishna and his energies. But uh, there is an, another differentiation. There is a difference of quality of energies. Prabhupada explains, the absolute realm and the living entities are of the same superior energy, but the material world is inferior energy. The living being is in contact with the inferior energy. The uh, living being in contact with the inferior energy is illusioned, thinking he belongs to the inferior energy. Okay, now what does this mean? Well, it's more hard, it's more difficult to understand matter than it is to understand spirit or the soul. Why? Because at one point, matter disappears, becomes invisible. And it's bewildering. Just like sometimes you go to the ATM machine with your credit card and you put your credit card in and you get some money that comes out and your credit card. Sometimes you can go to uh, the ATM machine, put your credit card in, you don't get any money, and the machine eats your credit card. Why? Because you have no money in your account. That's why or your account is overdrawn. So then you have to go inside, talk to the teller, say, this is not possible, I always have money in my account. They say, oh, we're sorry to tell you, you don't. there's no money in your account. Well, how's that possible? He says, show me, show me the, the details of the last month, all the transactions. You know, you look at that and you say, oh, my God, my wife made a check for $5,000. You know, my God, you know, she didn't tell me about that. You know, so <laughs> now, now he says, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know I'm overdrafted. I'll have to do something. You know? So you see, uh, in the same way, uh, People make mistakes, and the mistake is to think everything is relative. The mistake is to believe what mundane speculative philosophers say, and atheistic philosophers, even though you, they use big language and, and flowery uh, uh, flights of, uh, of uh, uh, let's say, choice words and so forth, but they are speculators. They're nonsense. They don't know what they're talking about. And, and, but if you believe them, then you become illusioned also. They, they have a worse disease than corona. Their disease is speculation. And they teach you to speculate. They think it's good to speculate. They teach kids to speculate, you see. Okay, so 
there's no difference between the energy and energetic, but there is a difference of quality of energies. So the spiritual energy is always manifest. But the material energy at some time, at some point, becomes unmanifest. You can't see it. And it's bewildering. Just like your bank account can be zero or minus zero. And it's bewildering. So it's more difficult to understand the material energy than the spiritual energy. Therefore, we have to understand it through the Bhagavad Gita, Jnana Chaksus. So the absolute realm and the living entities are the same superior energy, but the material world is inferior energy. The living being in contact with the inferior energy is illusioned, thinking he belongs to the inferior energy. Yeah, people think, well, it's just normal, you know, getting old. And it's just normal dying. And and then when it, when you die, everything is over. So better, better we live, you know, very dynamically while we have time and live life to the fullest, which means have as much sense gratification as you can get. Beg borrow or steal it. And they live these lives of complete uh, self-dissipation. They, they just uh, waste their mind and their senses uh, through mundane activities, mundane thoughts, listening to poetry and uh, listening to speculative philosophies, and learning them. Y you know, I. I, I used to have a lot of trouble reading philos philosophical w books in high school and college. And I was always wondering, you know, why, why does this stuff not make sense to me? Right? And, and then when, uh, yeah, first of all, they used all, you know, high language, and, and then they, they coined new words, and, and then they make these uh, long explanations. And I had, I've always had difficulty... When, when I read Bhagavad Gita, I also had some difficulty with that, but when devotees explained it to me, it made sense. But later, under, later on, I understood why I was having so much difficulty with the mundane philosophers, because they're all speculation. There's nothing authentic about it. It's all speculation from Socrates right up to the most modern philosophers. So then I realized, wow, this is unfair. They don't warn you when you're a kid that you're going to be subjected to all kinds of speculation that's, that's going to take you away from understanding what the truth is. And you can be on a tangential course for your whole life without realizing that you were misled. See? So therefore, there is the sense of relativity in the material world. In the absolute, there is no such sense of difference between the knower and the known and therefore, everything there is absolute. Now, materialistic people would not accept that sentence. They said, this is, this, is, this is nonsense. We don't accept that. And because of that, they remain materialists. They remain vishayis. They remain sense gratificators, gratifiers. They remain speculators. As mentioned above, Prabhupada said, the analogy of the sun and the sunshine is helpful for understanding Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. The three aspects of the absolute truth. In one sense, there is no difference between these three terms, just as there is, in one sense, no difference between the sunshine, the sun globe, and the sun god, Vibhaswan. All of them are light. The inhabitants of the sun globe, led by Vibhaswan, possess bodies made of fire, and therefore everything in the sun is glowing. From a great distance, we see the sun as a glowing globe, and the sunshine is the glow. So Brahman is like the sunshine, Paramatma like the localized sun globe, and Bhagavan like the sun god. They are all one in the sense that they are all the pure light of the absolute truth, but still there is a difference. Now, here we have an example of studying the known to understand, or beginning with the known, to understand the unknown. So, because Krishna is subject and object, we can find examples in the material world that help us understand what's going on in the spiritual world. Because there's no difference between the subject and object. So everywhere, whether it's the spiritual world or the material world, we will see that there is a chintya, beda, a beda tattva. 
You just have to know how to recognize it. And everywhere in the spiritual world is Krishna, and everywhere in the material world is Krishna also. You just have to learn how to recognize it. Therefore, Krishna begins to explain how he's everywhere in the material world in the seventh chapter, in the tenth chapter, and the eleventh chapter of Bhagavad Gita. If you read them carefully, you will learn how to recognize Krishna everywhere in the material world. So then Prabhupada says, <clears throat> he says, if you stand in the sunshine, that does not mean that you have reached the sun globe or seen the predominating deity of the sun, Vivaswan. Similarly, the different means for understanding absolute truth produce different realizations. The different means for understanding absolute truth produce different realizations. One who tries to understand absolute truth simply by mental speculation may ultimately realize the impersonal Brahman. In other words, through speculation, you might be able to understand impersonal Brahman. And one who tries to understand absolute truth through meditative yoga practice may be able to realize Paramatma. But one who practices bhakti yoga can achieve complete understanding of the absolute truth and realize the spiritual form of Bhagavan, the personality of Godhead, who is the original source of everything. So now this, this makes things clear. The Mayavadi speculators might understand something, not everything, but something about Brahman. And the yogis who are doing a lot of meditation, like uh, the Buddhists and others, and other yogis uh, following Patanjali Yoga, they may understand Paramatma. But only the devotees can understand Bhagavan, including Paramatma and Brahman. So, now we see why some people may merge into the Brahman effulgence, but because they have no knowledge of what's beyond the Brahman effulgence, they fall down. And some people may be able through meditation to see Paramatma. However, at that last moment when after all their years of austerities and meditation, they see Paramatma, they say, ah, Tatvamasi, that's me. And they merge into Paramatma. So the Mayavadis merge into Brahman and the Patanjali uh, false uh, followers merge into the body of Krishna. There are two types of merging. So it's like Sisupala, when he was killed by uh, Krishna, he merged into the body of Krishna. So that is a second type of merging. And they don't stay there eternally. They can fall down from there as soon as they have the slightest whiff of a material desire. And of course, you can fall down from Brahman. Brahman is already a fallen situation because there's no devotional service there. So it's already fallen. So it's, you don't fall down from somewhere fallen. You fall down from Goloka or Vaikuntha. But Brahman is already a fallen position. So we see how the impersonalist uh, uh, Brahmavadis and then the impersonalist uh, yogis, they because they have incomplete knowledge, they don't achieve Goloka or even Vaikuntha. They, they, they stay somewhere in some merged situation. So then Prabhupada says that the one who practices Bhakti Yoga can achieve complete understanding of the Absolute Truth and realize the spiritual form of Bhagavan the personality of God, who is the original source of everything. Okay, so I don't want to go too long. There's a lot more to say about this, but we'll stop right there. Are there any questions?
one perspective, yeah. Looking at it from one perspective. Well, they don't, they don't, yeah. They only go through the now, see, there are bona fide impersonalists, like the four Kumaras, who went to the Brahman realization, but because they were surrendered to their guru, uh, Brahma, and also because they actually went to the door of Vaikuntha, but they had association with uh, uh, Lord Narayana. They went past the Brahman realization directly to uh, uh, Vaikuntha and, and then eventually understanding Krishna. So if you have a, f a half guru, then he can only take you half the way or one quarter of the way, right? But if you have uh, association of real guru and real guru is connected to Krishna through parampara, then you can go through the st through the stages: Brahman, Paramatma, Bhagavan. The problem is the guru. If they're not fully realized, they can only take their disciple to their their level of realization. Now that's why. Sometimes you see that a guru will recommend his disciple or her disciple to go see another guru, to learn something that they may not be expert enough to teach. That happens uh, a lot. See. But in the case where the Mayavadis, the Kevala Advaitins, you know, absolute oneness, that's, that's called Kevala Advaita, they deny you know, a fanatically, this is anything beyond Brahman. So, therefore, the disciple can only go as far as the guru is able to take them. So those gurus are not real gurus. A Mayavadi is not really a guru because they're also speculating. And, and, and the disciple has to realize that they can't take them very far. They can, you, you, through speculation, yes, you can understand something about Brahman. Uh, you take LSD, you see Brahman. You take LSD, you'll see Brahman, but you won't stay there, and you don't really understand what it's all about. It's just there's some feeling. Oh, I saw the light. Oh, it was so wonderful, you know. But that's just a momentary thing. Then you come down again, and you're back in the material world, and uh, it's just a dream. So it all depends on who you choose as a guru. If you choose someone who's enlightened in one of the bona fide Vaishnavas, Sampradayas, they can take you back to Godhead, either step by step or, or directly. So Prabhupada, see, he's teaching us what Lord Chaitanya was teaching, that it's in the end of the eighth chapter, Prabhupada says, a very important statement. He says, the beauty of Krishna consciousness, however, is that by one stroke, by engaging in devotional service, one can surpass all the rituals of the different orders of life. One stroke. What is that stroke? It's chanting Hare Krishna, Maha Mantra, regularly, every day, at least 16 good rounds, and following the regulative principles, very quickly you can make spiritual advancement. Whereas the other paths, they're all difficult and there's no guarantee that you reach the ultimate goal. You reach, just like you can go up two steps in a stairway or four steps in a stairway, but there's a thousand steps in the stairway. So just because you made two steps or four steps, you didn't get to the top. You're on the way. But some people believe two steps, that's it. I'm at the top because they've been misled. Right. 
I'm reading from books that you never read. <laughs> it's called Dharma, The Way of Transcendence. These are lectures that Prabhupada gave on first, cha first canto, second chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. Okay, so we'll stop right there. Thank you very much. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. I'll continue with this a little bit more tomorrow. <laughs>